Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Grumbling, fault finding, is a much bigger problem than what we can ever imagine that it is. And I'm committed more than ever in my life to trying to do everything that I can to be thankful to God and to say so. And not only to God, but to other people. We need to tell the people in our life that we appreciate that we appreciate them. You know something I'm thankful for? I'm thankful for all the people that helped me do what God has called me to do. Dave and I sat this morning before we came over here and we were talking about just how amazing it is all the people that God gives to make something like this happen. You have no idea how many people it takes for you to be able to walk in here on a Sunday morning and plop your cute little bottom down and enjoy everything that's going on and then go on back out, get a Starbucks, have lunch, and go home. I mean, it's amazing the amount of work that it takes and the dedicated volunteers. And what a shame it is if there are people who have the privilege of being in a place like this and you never bother to say thank you, but you're quick to complain when there's something that you don't like. That is one of the greatest tragedies that we have in our world today. And nothing shows how much we don't appreciate God any quicker than that. Amen? Well, I decided in preparation for this message, because I've known a while I was going to preach it, I decided that I was going to take about eight weeks and keep a list of things that happened to me that I wasn't planning for, wasn't expecting, that were inconvenient and irritating. And that when I got to the end of that list, that I could work it into my message. So here's some things that have happened to me over the last eight weeks. Our water was off for 24 hours. My aunt had shingles in her eyes and had to go to an eye specialist. I had a situation I wasn't expecting at work with an employee. Dave had back surgery and couldn't go to Indonesia with me. I flew 47 hours and seven days to get to Indonesia to minister to the people. And while I was there, for the first time in five years, the city flooded. <laughs> yes. While I was there, my aunt had to be taken to the hospital with pneumonia. Three hours after I got home from Indonesia with tremendous jet lag, I got a call from the hospital. Somebody's got to come get your aunt right now. We're releasing her. And another employee issue. Our website was down two days. The phones went off at the office one day. Jammed my toe into the leg of the couch, but thankfully it wasn't the toe that I tore the tendons in. <laughs> but it was on the same foot, so now we have two toes that are messed up. Spilled a box of crackers in the pantry floor. And I mean, they cracked and went all over the place. Had to tell my aunt she had to move to the nursing home because she was no longer able to take care of herself. Had a stomach virus for seven days. Fire alarms were being tested in my hotel all day. <laughs> Ordered a bedspread and they shipped me the wrong one. This morning I made my coffee and I didn't have the pot all the way under the thing and so I ended up with part coffee and part grounds and had to make it over. I'm telling you what, 10 years ago, those eight weeks, I would have gotten so mad and so frustrated, and I would have run my mouth off, and I would have said, I just can't believe it. Can you believe it? Why me? Why does this stuff always happen to me? I don't think there was one of those things that disturbed me or bothered me. I didn't give, it to my, give my energy to it at all. Many of them, I laughed so hard, I couldn't hardly stand it. Dave can tell you, the night I jammed my toe into the couch and spilled the crackers in the floor, I mean, I was on my way to bed, and these crackers just went everywhere. I mean, under the water bottles and every place. And so I'm down there on my hands and knees trying to pick these things up, and I am laughing my head off. And he came out and said, what is so funny? I said, I spilled these crackers all over the floor, and now i got to pick them up. He said, I enjoyed more than anything the change in your attitude over the past several years. <laughs> Can I tell you something? No matter how mad I got, the crackers wouldn't have gotten off the floor and got back up in the box. 
And so you might as well learn to go with the flow and just be happy where you're at, because complaining about it is not going to change it. Come on. I'm telling you what, I believe that what I'm talking about here today, simple as it is, nothing profound, nothing new, I believe that if we will enter this year with a new attitude and really ask God to help us not complain but to be more thankful, I can honestly say that I believe that some of you are going to get those breakthroughs that you've been looking through. I, I think some of the things that we've been thinking are the problem are not the real problem. We are the problem. Is it your problem that's your problem, or is it your attitude toward your problem that's the problem? One more time. Is your problem your problem, or is it your attitude toward your problem that is your problem? I think maybe these people over here need it too. <laughs> is your problem your problem, or is it your attitude toward your problem that is your problem. You know what? Every single person in this room today, every single solitary one of us, we have a lot more to be thankful for than we do to complain about. Every one of us, every single one of us have a lot more to be thankful for than we do to complain about. And when we praise God and we're thankful, it opens the door for the Holy Spirit to work really amazing things in our life. But when we complain, it opens a door for the devil. <gasps> okay, I'll prove it to you. <laughs> Numbers 24, Numbers 21, 4 through 7. God, I pray that every time that anybody in here complains, you're going to make them aware of it. That they're going to change that complaint into a praise. The Israelites took 40 years to make an 11-day trip. Amazingly dumb, I don't... <laughs> 40 years to make an 11-day journey. That's one of the most amazing things in the Bible to me. And yet, we do the same thing. Is it always the devil that's keeping us from getting what we want? Or is the way we're responding to circumstances and situations in our life? I think the devil has a very hard time controlling a really content, happy believer. So they wandered around out there for all these years, and they thought it was their enemies. And long story short, many years ago, God gave me a message that I called wilderness mentalities, and he showed me that it wasn't their enemies. It wasn't the Jergesites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and all those ites. We've all got our own brand of ites. It can be the grouchy neighborites, the backacheites, the bad bossites, but we've all got them. That wasn't what it was. It was their attitude. And I did this long series of teachings about 10 or 12 different attitudes they had that I believe kept them from making progress. And one of them was complaining. Numbers 21, verse 4, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient, depressed, and much discouraged because of the trials of the way. Because of the 37 things they had on their list, or however many things it was. And the people spoke against God and against Moses, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and we hate this light, contemptible, unsubstantial manna. The very thing that was so amazingly miraculous to them a short time before, now they despised it. Don't complain about cleaning that big house you begged God to give you. <laughs> Woo! I feel the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Amen? Don't murmur about washing that car that God has so graciously given you. If you don't want to wash it, you could walk or ride the bus. Like a lot of people who don't have one. Amen? 
Don't complain about the kids you beg God to give you. Don't complain about the person you're married to. You prayed 15 years to get married, and now you got it? Be happy with it. Verse 5, so they spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread. There's no water. We hate this manna. Verse 6, and the Lord sent fiery burning serpents among the people. And they bit the people, and many of the Israelites died. And the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. Well, duh. I mean, why do we have to get in that kind of a mess before we realize that our attitude is getting us in trouble? I said, why do we have to get in that kind of a mess before we realize that our attitude is getting us in trouble? Oh, my gosh, we can slam the door right in the devil's face if we'll just stay happy. And being happy is better. Well, sister, if you had my problems, you wouldn't be happy either. You don't know what's going on in my life. You didn't know about those years when I preached to you and I felt like my head was splitting in half while I was doing it. You don't know about a lot of things that are going on in other people's lives. And we don't know about everything that's going on in your life. But God knows. And he's the only one that can do anything about it. And he will if we pray with thanksgiving. But he can't if all we do is complain. And the people came to Moses. We have sinned. <laughs> Now, what did they say their sin was? We spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and then they lifted up a bronze servant on a, a serpent on a pole. They said, whoever looks to the serpent on the pole will be healed. And, of course, we know that is a representation of Christ being lifted up on the cross, bearing our sins. And so, thankfully... Thankfully, thankfully, when we get in trouble, we can look to Christ and he'll be merciful and gracious to us and forgive us and turn things around for us. But it's, it's not a matter that we can't be forgiven. It's like, why waste the time, the effort, and the energy? You know, the fact that we can be forgiven is great, but there's something even better. And that's like, let's get smart enough not to get in trouble to start with. I don't want to just live my life doing the wrong thing and begging God to get me out of it, doing the wrong thing, begging God to get me out of it, sinning, getting forgiven, sinning, getting forgiven, getting under condemnation, crawling out from under it. I want to move beyond that and get to the point where I'm led by the Holy Spirit and I will listen to God before I get in trouble. Yeah. Can I tell you a secret? I believe that every time we get ourselves in trouble, God has tried to tell us several times beforehand not to do the thing we did that got us in trouble. But we're like little kids. We got to try and just see. Johnny, don't touch that stove. It's hot, hot. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> told you not to touch it. You do understand how important this is, right? That this is not just a little hoopla message. I think this is something that we should begin to pray about. Study on your own. You know, you won't get what you need just hearing me preach this message today. I mean, honestly, you won't. Because this is not something we get over easy. It's, it's too in our nature to murmur and grumble and complain about stuff. And I really believe that God wants us to be like bright lights shining out in a dark world. And giving him praise while everybody else is complaining their heads off. And I'm going to show you a scripture that says just exactly that in a minute. 1 Corinthians 10, 9. We should not tempt the Lord and try his patience and become a trial to him, critically appraising him and exploiting his goodness as some of them did and were put entirely out of the way and killed by poisonous serpents. 
Nor should we discontentedly complain as some of them did and were put out of the way entirely by the destroyer. Now these things befell them by way of a figure and an example and a warning to us. They were written to admonish and fit us for right action by good instruction. So what's he saying? I'm, I'm writing, I'm putting in here. Paul said, I'm putting in here what happened to the Israelites back in Numbers. So we can be instructed and learn not to do what they did. We don't have to. You can slam the door in the devil's face when you have problems by finding something to praise God about. And the Bible says, in all things, give thanks. In the middle of every circumstance, give thanks. No matter what's happening to you, give thanks. We can always find something to be thankful for in every situation. No matter how many things that you think are wrong with the person that you're married to, if you would just take time to start making a list of all the things that you do like, pretty soon you wouldn't even be bothered with the stuff that you don't like. And this is something that we have to do on purpose. It's not something we can wait to feel like doing. We have to do it on purpose. Paul said, I've learned how to be content. Satisfied to the point where I'm not disturbed. Rather, I'm abased or abounding. I love that. He didn't say that he liked his situation. He said, I'm satisfied to the point where I'm not disturbed. That didn't mean he didn't want any change. But he said, I'm satisfied to the point. You know what? With the life that God has given me, if I had to put up with 37 things like are on this list every eight weeks in my life, I could still be happy because I have got such a great life. How could I let these things steal my joy and then be totally unaware of all the good things that God's doing? You see what happens when we focus on what God's not doing, then we don't even pay any attention to what He is doing. And I know that many of you know this, and many of you are already practicing this. I know that you get a lot of encouragement here, and this is a very thankful church and thankful congregation. But this is something that we need to be reminded of over and over and over. It's not enough just to do it in church. We need to do it when we're out in public. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Last night I shared a message about the last days and the way that we should be living in the midst of the times that we're in. And the main point I wanted to get across was we cannot blend in, we have to stand out. There's a great danger today in just blending in to what's going on and where the world really can't see any difference in us and them. It's like, I don't want to have to look for the believers. I want them to stand out. I, I, I want it to be a situation where I'm not around somebody very long that's a believer and I know that they're a believer. I think God and our relationship with God, not like we're trying to cram it down people's throat, but it just needs to be part of our everyday life. It just needs to be something that's, that's there. Don't ever be ashamed of the name of Christ. Don't ever be ashamed that you're a believer. Don't feel that you have to hide that. Philippians 2, verse 14 and 15. This is so good. Do all things without grumbling and fault finding and complaining. <laughs> all things. Drive in traffic. Do the dishes. Wait in line. Do the laundry. Cut the grass. And can I tell you something? I believe with all my heart that it's in these little things that our character is tested. It's not about whether or not you're willing to go to Africa if God calls you. It's can you cut the grass without complaining? Can you get in and out of the grocery store without complaining about high prices? Well, they are high. Well, complaining about it's not going to make them lower. You know what I'd say if I were you in there? God, I thank you that you've given me the money to get what I need to eat. And... You know what I say? I, re I refuse to be afraid about what's going on in the world today. Well, you know, they say that gas is going to get to be such and such and such and such. Well, you know what I say? Whatever it is, God's going to give me the money to get however much of it I need to get where I need to go. 
And I know that there are people that are going through difficult times. I know that. And maybe you feel like, well, I've tried all this happy, clappy, sappy stuff, and, you know, I've still got a lot of problems. Well, God is not something you try. These are life-changing principles that you get them in your heart and you say, devil, I am going to outlast you. I am going to win. I am going to persevere. God is on my side, and I am going to see breakthrough and good things happen in my life, and you are not going to use my mouth to go around murmuring and complaining and grumbling all the time because God is good to me. And you know, if nothing else, at least you can go look at yourself in the mirror and say, I am not going to hell. <laughs> Hallelujah. My sins are forgiven, and I am not going to hell. I am going to live forever in the presence of God. Amen? All right, now watch, because this is very important for the times we're living in. Do all things without grumbling and fault-finding complaining against God and questioning and doubting among yourselves. That you may, why, why? That you may show yourselves to be blameless and guileless, innocent and uncontaminated, children of God without blemish, faultless, unrebukable in the midst of a crooked and a wicked generation. Spiritually perverted and perverse among whom you are seen as bright lights. We talked last night about turning the light up. We talked about how we're the light of the world, and the world is full of darkness, and if we will just begin to shine, if we pretend like we're a three-way light, let's turn it up a notch. Let's turn it up a couple of notches. And here, this simple little scripture says, hey, you can really turn your light up bright if you'll just stop complaining. You know, what, you know how unusual that is in the world today to find somebody who's not complaining about everything? You know how challenging it is to get stuck in a two-hour traffic jam and be able to sit there and not complain? Ow. <laughs> Do I hit it 100% of the time? Absolutely not. But I'm taking what I felt like God said to me very, very seriously. I want my prayer power to increase. I want it to multiply. I want to pray and see answers quicker than ever before. And I want to pray for other people and see answers in their life quicker than ever before. If you're going to complain about something, don't bother to pray about it. That's what God said to me. Let's be bright, bright lights shining out in a dark world. What do you have to be thankful for? So many things. What can we be thankful for right this moment? Well, let's see. I'm thankful that I preached last night, this morning, and again right now, and pretty soon I'm going to be done, <laughs> and I can go home. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm not grateful to be here and I don't love doing it. But, you know, we're, we're all thrilled when we've accomplished something and it's finished. There's always something to be grateful for if you just look for it. I don't care if you've got five body parts that's hurting. Thank God for the ones that aren't. <laughs> Amen? I pray for you all in the name of Jesus. That God would take this message and just re-preach it to you over and over and over and over in the upcoming weeks. Not unto condemnation, but unto victory. Help us, God, to not have a complaint without a vision. Help us to not complain about something we're not willing to do anything about. Help us, God, to be bright lights shining out clearly in a dark world. I think this is a way that we can serve you, God. I think this is a special little way that we can serve you just to get out in the world and always find something to be joyful about. Father, I pray that you'd forgive us for complaining that all those doors that we've opened, you would shut today by your mercy and grace and give us a fresh start to be grateful and thankful 
for all that you've done in our lives. You know, I truly believe that the more we complain about a situation, the longer we will remain in it. If we want to see a breakthrough in our lives, then we need to start really being thankful and praising God and having an attitude of just real gratitude of what God is doing in our lives. Don't just look at what He hasn't done yet or what you don't have, but look at the positive, what you do have, and be grateful for that. That's something we all need to do. I've done medical missions so many times over the past couple years. This is actually the 19th time that I've come into settings just like this. And the sobering reality of the poverty that we see. But that's one thing I love about Hand of Hope is that we get to be a part of, of this solution and that we get to come in and help feed the malnourished and, and help bring medical care to the sick. It's always a blessing to come back to places year after year and see the improvement and watch the community look better and look healthier and to see the children not as, as malnourished. It's, it's incredible. It's so much about sharing. We come here to share God's love, to share the medicine, to share the free care. So these teeth become very, very painful. To share the food and the feeding programs. And one thing I love about God is that he doesn't ask you to give what you don't have, but he asks you to give what you do have. And no matter what that is, it always makes a difference in people's lives. And it truly is about sharing. And that is making a lasting impact on, on people and places just like here in Agacha, Ethiopia.